Well, hey, everybody. I'm so glad to be with you again this week in your home. You know what? I miss you guys. I love you with everything in me, but I miss being with you physically at our locations. I know you feel the same way, but I'm so thankful. Another shout out to our tech team who makes it possible for me to be able to come to you in your homes, and I'm grateful for the opportunity that we have to do that. Uh, we're in a series that I started a couple of weeks ago that we had pre-planned called Highlands is Home. And, you know, it's just like the Lord, how he goes before us. Uh, I had no idea when we were planning this series, it's sort of the celebration of 25 years of all the God stories that he's done in our church as we come to the close of that. But when we planned Highlands is Home, it was just, you know, I didn't know that I would be coming to you in your actual home to deliver these messages. So you may be a lot like me. I have spent more time at my home over the last few weeks than I have in a long time. And I've noticed so many things in my home that I hadn't noticed before. You know, all the kids are there, so we've tried to make the best of it, as I'm sure you have, and we've done some pretty neat things I'm going to be talking to you about during the message today. But I want to talk to you a little bit about a message of hope and just try to encourage you. And you know, my desire for our church has always been for it to feel like home. Uh, at the beginning of the year, I had the opportunity to go and visit all of our physical locations. And you know what? Every time I went to one of our physical locations, I felt like I was going home. I mean, it was awesome. You know, I got to meet so many of you. And in those days, you know, we gave a hug to each other and a handshake. And it was our way of normal greeting. Uh, for this season that we've had to social distance ourselves, it's been hard for folks like us, hasn't it? I mean, that's been a challenge for us. One of these days, we're going to be able to get back together physically. I can't wait for that day. And in the process between now and then, let's think about how we're doing in our individual homes, and let's think about how we want our church to be like home. I felt valued, encouraged, uplifted, and man, it was so exciting to go to all of our locations, and again, every location I went to, I felt like I was home. And I realized this place, this church for us, is a lot like home to so many people. I mean, thousands and thousands of you would call Highlands home. That's what we want it to be, right? I mean, we want our church to feel like home. We want to create an atmosphere in the church like you're trying to create in your home, and some of us have to be really creative to do this, where you know, it's a place of safety and encouragement. It's a place of value. It's a place where you look forward to being. So again, I'm grateful for this series that Highlands is home. And I want you to think about that today. When we moved to Abingdon, we've been residents of Abingdon now for about four years. Uh, we bought a home that our entire family loved. Uh, we drove by this home. We had a realtor with us, and she was showing us several homes. And this is one of the first homes we drove by. And I remember when we drove by this home that Brenda said, I love that home. And then, you know, how these things go. We checked the price, and it was way out of our budget. And so we thought, uh, there's no way we can do that. Well, it ended up being that a family in our church actually owned the home, and we were able to, to get it to a price where we could afford to buy this home. So we sold the family farm. And we moved to Abington, and every kid was excited. You know, every kid had their own room, and we had a couple of acres that Chris in the backyard could play with, you know, play in. We had these awesome climbing trees, and uh, it's in a great neighborhood. And we found that in this neighborhood, our neighbors are just incredible. I mean, they're just amazing people. And as we made plans to move into this new home, uh, we realized that it needed a refresh. It had been rented by a lady for several years. And so uh, when we went in and we visited, we had to get a contractor. And for the next six months or so, we painted and stained and tore out the old and built some new. And what we tried to do is we tried to give uh, this home a facelift, sort of a refresh to bring it into a new era. And we did this because we weren't interested in just having a house. I mean, we wanted our family to have a home where we had an open door and an open table and an open heart. And Brenda and I knew there were certain things that we wanted in a house. And in that house, in, or, in order to make it a home, we found some must-haves that we wanted 
for our home. So I want you to think about this because we've all been at home and these must-haves that I want to share with you, I want to give you six must-haves that I believe every home ought to have. And I've noticed this a lot more since I've been at home. And these are true for our church as well, God's home, His church. So take out a little pen. You don't have a lot else to do. and Write a few notes down with me this morning. And, and I want you to get these six must-haves. And as you're sort of homebound, sheltering in place, I want you to think about these six must-haves in your own home. Here's the first, first must have, every home has to have. It's a solid foundation, a solid foundation. When we bought our house, we paid a home inspector to come and he looked over our house for about four hours one day and the goal of getting the home inspector was to tell us, is there anything, because we're not contractors, is there anything that we need to be aware of before we make the final purchase on this home? Is there anything crazy that we don't see? Because we looked at it and we thought, man, it looks like a pretty neat house. And he found a few things, you know, we looked at his report. But his report came back and he said, even though the home's like 25 years old or so, One of the things he saw was it didn't have any cracks in the foundation. So he said, Alan, the neatest thing about this house, even though it's older, it needs some updates, it has a solid foundation. It's got a solid foundation. Now, probably the most famous leaning structure in the whole world is what? It's the Leaning Tower of Pisa, right? And why is it leaning? It's 179 feet tall, I think. It only has like a nine to 10 foot foundation. The thing's 17 feet out of plumb. It continues to lean over and over every year. It doesn't have a solid foundation. Every contractor knows that in order to build a strong, stable home, you got to start. This is a starting place. You got to have a solid foundation. So, Doesn't it make more sense if you're going to build a great life and a great family and a great home that we all need solid foundations for our family and for our church as well? Jesus, uh, he tells us this as well. You know, he, he understands this. He taught this a long time before we got it. Notice what he says. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and then puts them into practice is like a wise man who built their house on a rock And the rains came and the streams rose and the winds blew and they beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on a rock. You know, one of the things I love so much about our church, uh, I mean, truly, honestly, is how so many people have found and are finding a solid foundation in which to build your life and your family And in order to have a great life, guys, you got to have a solid foundation. How do we do that here at our church? You know what we unapologetically do is we teach God's Word. This is our foundation upon which everything is built here at our church. We believe that this is God's Word to us, His message to us. We're passionate about that in all of our adult services. We're passionate about it in all of our kids' services. We're passionate about it in all of our student services. The one thing that you'll see in every ministry that we have is we're going to teach the Bible. And what are our our building materials? You know, when you think about this, what are we building into adults' lives and kids' lives and young people's lives? Man, our building materials, according to the Bible, are things like kindness and love and humility and courage and confidence. Things like compassion and integrity and patience. I mean, we got some high-quality building materials that we teach on week after week after week. And that kind of life will not only stand up to storms, but it will stand up to make a difference for the long haul. So keep building your home, keep building your family on the solid rock, the words of Jesus Christ, because the storms that blow against us, and we're in one right now, right? It will, uh, those storms, your home will not crash. Your family will not crash when we have a solid foundation. It's a must have, a solid foundation. Here's the second must have. Lots of natural light. Yeah, you may watch these home shows. I sort of enjoy watching these home shows. I've been watching them more (laughs) since I've been home at night because there's nothing else on, right? And uh, these folks who flip homes, they go in, tear it down, all those kind of things. I think it's pretty neat. Well, one of the things that sort of struck out about this home that we bought is it had big old windows. I love that about this home. I think every home needs to have lots of natural light. Uh, You know, I'm not a big fan of drapes and shades. I just, I like windows open. I like lots of light streaming in. 
I love a sunrise and I love a sunset. It's just every sunrise, God's saying, good morning. And every sunset, God says, good night. Uh, you know what God's heart for your home is? That it would be full of natural light. In fact, notice what Jesus said. He says, you are the light of the world. It's talking to all of us who are believers in Jesus. And he says, let your light shine in such a way that it throws a floodlight on your heavenly father. So we're just, we're just reflecting our light back to God. We're giving God praise and glory and honor. We're just, we're just loving God. Just show up and shine is what Jesus is saying. Let me give you a must-have verse. <laughs> it's over in Romans 12, 9. It's what Paul says. He says, don't just pretend to love others. He says, truly, really love others. Really love them. Show up in this dark world and just shine. And church, I want to tell you something. I know we're sort of sheltered in our homes right now, but you're still going out to the store every now and then getting those basic supplies. I don't know that there's ever been a time in the history of our world that the church needs to shine like we need to shine today. We are the voice of hope. I believe we have such an incredible opportunity to be God's love and God's light in this darkness we find ourselves in. It's a way that we can dispense hope to others. That's exactly when we get to the opportunity of meeting physically together again. And guys, we will. We're going to get through this. We'll meet at our physical locations again. And it's what our host teams will do for you. They're just going to shine. You're just going to see these folks help you get a parking place and help you get a seat and help you get your kids to the right place. They just shine. They just shine the light of Jesus. Yeah, you know, my youngest son, Chris, 10 years old, just turned 10. Yeah, you know that kid, uh, he's had a lot in his 10 years old. You know, we're a new family for Chris. We adopted him now. We've had him several, you know, a few years, but not a long time. And he's always in a new family. He's had a lot of stuff in his past. And you know what? That kid just shines. Every time I look at Chris, he just reminds me of the resiliency in God's people and God's kids. Uh, he sings all the time. I mean, he just sings all the time. He wakes up, no lie. And he sings all the way downstairs. None of my other kids do this. Every time we're going in the car somewhere, Chris will be in the back seat, and it'll be completely quiet. Sometimes I'm just trying to focus on what I got going. Chris singing. He's back, he's back there singing. He told me the other day, he said, Dad, we really need to pray for my classmates because I don't want to see any of my classmates get sick. He just shines his light. You know, just shines his light. You know what I've learned? I think the darker a place gets, the brighter the light gets as it shines. We have an opportunity to shine today. Uh, I, I remember the darkest place physically I've ever been in my life was I was invited to go down to McClure Mines. It was an underground mine, a deep mine. They had a long wall. I'd never seen one like this. I wanted to go see it. And so the foreman took me 2,000 feet down into the earth, and then we went on this little buggy out to where the long wall was mining. And when we finally get to long, it's like a little city. I mean, they got all these fluorescent lights down there, and this huge, massive machine is mining these steams of coal, and it was incredible to see. And then the foreman said, he said, he said Alan, what's the darkest place you've ever been? I said, I don't know, probably, you know, someplace when the power goes out. And he, he uh, put on his radio, cut the lights out. And guys, it was so dark, you could not see your hand in your face. I mean, it was, it was the darkest place I've ever seen. And in the midst of that darkness, he had a little light on his helmet, and he cut that light on, and it was like, I mean, it was like the world came into existence, you know? Just that little light. You might be thinking, I can't shine much. I'm a little discouraged today. I'm a little disillusioned. I'm scared. I'm a little anxious. But if you know Jesus Christ, you've got a light to shine. And guys, I think our world calls for us to shine our light. I love what Paul says over in Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. Paul's in a prison cell. He knows his execution is looming near. It's a book about joy. And look what he says in chapter 2, verse 15. He says, do all you have, do all you have to do without grumbling and arguing so that you may be seen as God's children, blameless, sincere, wholesome, living in this warped and diseased world where you're shining there like lights in a dark place. That's so good, isn't it? God's heart for your life is that it's full of supernatural light. Guys, just shine. 
just shine in this day. Here's the third must have. It's a lack of clutter, <laughs> a lack of clutter. You know, um, the lady that had rented our house, she was elderly, she was a business lady and her business shut down. So she moved everything in her business into our house. And there was lots of stuff. I mean, I remember when we first went and looked at this house, I mean, uh, we loved that all the kids had a room, but you couldn't really see too much. I mean, you sort of went through these paths and such, and there were things stacked all the way to the ceiling. There's lots of stuff everywhere. Uh, now, Brenda loved the house at first sight, and the kids liked having the room and such. And Chris loved the backyard, had all these climbing trees. One thing stood out to me. I, I could live anywhere. It had a two-car garage. That's what, that's what sold me on the house. I mean, I had this two-car garage, but she had all this stuff in this garage. And I just saw two garage doors. I'm thinking, that was where I hung out, our other house on the farm. Uh, we had a two-car garage. I put my lawnmower in there and all my Dewalt tools. I've got like two, you know, my drill. And then had my truck in there. And i just go out there. I sort of my man space, <laughs> whatever. And, uh, you know, when, when we finally buy the house and this lady finally moves all of her stuff out, uh, the kids moved their stuff in, their rooms, you know, and, and uh, it finally got to where we're sort of settling in. And I remember that first evening, I drive my truck into the garage. I hit the garage door. We finally got all the stuff out of the garage, moved up into the house. And then I get it pulled in and I hit the garage door to close the door and it doesn't close. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah, our brand new house, I already got a stinking garage door that don't work. So I'm like, well, maybe it's something simple. So I said, maybe I just tripped that little thing that keeps the garage door from closing on your cat, you know? So I go back, and as I go back, I realize my truck's sticking two feet out the garage. I'm like, you got to be kidding. This is a garage for smart cars, you know? I mean, neither one of our vehicles came anywhere close to fitting in this garage. I looked at all that clutter when we were buying that house in that garage, and I just assumed everything would be okay. But it didn't turn out okay at all. You know, since we've been sheltering in place, and you may relate, Brenda has been there with us, and she said, we need to clean. And so all the kids, you know, they love this, of course. We've been cleaning all this stuff. And we've only been in this house like three or four years. I'm thinking, how in the world did we get all this clutter already, you know? So we've been cleaning the best we can with the best attitude. I try to go back and think about what Paul said, you know, I want to do it with a good attitude. And, you know, when I look around at our house and we see all this clutter, one of the things I was thinking about this week, is I thought, not only do I see clutter in our house, but a lot of times when I look at our church, I see clutter in people's lives. Isn't that true? I mean, a lot of families, sometimes we can have so much clutter that it just keeps us from experiencing real life. I mean, we got often stuff from our past that we can't let go of. We have piles of shame and guilt and regret all over the place. We got boxes of bitterness. Somebody had done something wrong to us, just cluttering up our lives, cluttering up our families. I see so many of us, if there's any good thing that's come from this, is it's, it's caused our schedules to sort of stop, hadn't it? And most of us had schedules that were just beyond crazy. We had a to-do list and a schedule that just competed with every hour we had. And God might bring an opportunity to us, but we would have to look at that opportunity and say, Lord, I wish I could do this, but I'm just, you know, I'm sorry. I just don't have time to do it. I'm, rem I'm reminded what Dallas Willard, I quoted him last week, just one of my favorite guys. And he said, if you really want to know God, you have to ruthlessly eliminate busyness from your life. Think about that, guys. Ruthlessly eliminate busyness from our lives. One of the things this virus has done is it's done that for us in so many homes today. It has caused us to shelter in place. It's caused us to stay together as a family. You know, you don't have to be bored there. You can turn, begin to read the word of God. You can begin a relationship with Jesus that many of you have often craved, but you just said, I don't have time to do it. Now is a great time to do this. We, we know that wise people declutter their lives. Jesus decluttered his life, right? Uh, I mean, he had more demands, more people pulling on him from every conceivable direction. But he decluttered his life, and he lived a life with just a simple rhythm. He had a heart for his father. He had some healthy friendships that he, you know, was accountable to. 
And then he dispensed hope every time he went out. Uh, I love how he gives this invitation for us to have the same kind of life here in Matthew chapter 11. Look at what Jesus says in verse 28. He says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn, catch this, the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. And then he says this, keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Man, I love that passage. I really do. Doesn't that sound good to have that kind of thing? Just less clutter in your life. So a little review. Uh, we got to have a solid foundation. Uh, lots of natural light. Lack of clutter. Here's number four must have. I call it a playroom. Man, every house needs a playroom, right? I mean, I mean at least when you have kids, you got to have a playroom. And probably the bigger the room, the better. The bigger the physical space, the better. But here's what I've also learned. You may not have to have the physical space, but this I believe you got to have. You got to be willing to create an environment of joy and fun in your home. Uh, we've been, you know, uh, sort of spending a lot of time together as a family. So what have we been doing? Uh, we just try to get creative. We've been playing Monopoly a lot. We've been watching movies together. We've been actually sitting down for a family dinner together. I mean, the things that we're doing now in our home, we haven't done in a long time because the kids are here and everywhere else and we're working and we've got all these different demands placed on our life. So we've decided we're going to take advantage of this and we're going to be creative and try to get some things that will help our kids through this time as well. You know, our kids are concerned as well. They really are. It's different for them. They know this. I mean, they're not able to hang out with their buddies and such and their world's been turned upside down just like ours. So let's create an atmosphere of fun and eventually when we can live normal again, let's have a joy in our homes that kids can't wait to come home to, that their friends can't wait to come over and visit with us where there's laughter and peace and security and room for them just to be themselves. Honestly, I've tried to do this in every home I've lived in. I started out a little single wide trailer, but I think back at the fun, the laughter that we had there. And then I moved from a single wide trailer to a basement. <laughs> you know, I rented a little basement from a guy because was planting a church, having money. But we had an incredible time there. And then Brent and I got married. Our first little home was something like 800 square feet. I remember I could recline in our lazy boy and I could be in the living room. And when I flipped up the recliner, we were in the kitchen. You know, my feet were in the kitchen. I mean, we didn't have any space at all. But we think back about that little house and we were in it for several years and man, it was awesome. We had so much fun there. We had so much joy there. And then we finally built our dream house out on a farm and we picked this perfect place and we built this home that we'd always wanted and it was incredible. I mean, we had so many amazing moments there that we still cherish to this day. And then one day God said, hey, we want you to sell the farm. I've got a new assignment for you. I want you to move. And honestly, that was sort of a challenge for me, but we did what God said and we were obedient. And now we're in this home that we have. It's an older house, but man, we love it. And already making moments again, a place where laughter and joy can happen. Jesus said this in John 15, verse 11. He said, I told you these things so that you may be filled with joy and your joy will overflow. God's heart for your home is that it would be full of light and full of music and laughter and hugs and singing. Your joy should overflow. You know, uh, growing up in my home, in my childhood home, uh, my mom would always sing. And uh, I can remember her cooking supper and she'd be singing while she was cooking. I can remember her washing dishes and she'd be singing. And you know, as a kid, we had uncertain times. My sister was diagnosed with cancer and it was really a difficult time for us. And I remember her singing got us through so many times of uncertainty. Uh, I look around the world and we're seeing Italy right now and all the things that are happening in Italy, man, pray for that country. And yet you see these people who are rays of light and joy and they're going out on their little patios and sharing music with their neighbors. It's a powerful thing. I'm not suggesting that 
maybe you sing out loud. I surely wouldn't suggest that for myself at my house. You know, that'd be, that would be depressing. Uh, we shouldn't even try that. But what I'm saying is that we all ought to have still in the midst of uncertainty, a joyful song in our heart. God gives us that. He's our hope and he's our life. Here's another must have. Um, we got to have a laundry room, right? I mean, we got to have a laundry room, okay? Uh, as we've been home, I'm thinking, my goodness, how in the world do we have so many dirty clothes? You know, I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, I thought about what about a laundry room for our lives? We need that in our lives as well, don't we? I'm talking about making room in your life for messy people, even the ones that maybe live under the same roof as you do. Uh, the Bible tells us to be patient with each other, to cut each other some slack, to forgive each other. And then, you know, when college shut down, uh, one day, you know, Joseph calls, he says, hey, Dad, I'm coming home. And that dude comes home and he's got, I, I, was, I was like, he's got more dirty clothes in the car than the car could even hold, you know? And here he comes with all of his dirty clothes and he says, hey, I'm home, you know? <laughs> I'm like, I'm not sure I want to hang out with you or not for sure, you know? But you know what? When he pulled up to our door, it reminded me of when I showed up at God's home, God's house, when I had all this dirty laundry in my life, right? And God accepted me and he loved me. You know, we come to know Jesus when we have lots of dirty laundry. And you know what Jesus does? He washes us clean, washes us clean. Many of you that are watching online today, and I know that's the only way you can get the service today, but many of you, you might be able to relate. And you might be thinking, my goodness, you know, I've got so much dirty laundry in my life. There's no way that this God you're talking about wants anything to do with me. I'd be, I'm sort of like your son that shows up with all of his dirty laundry. And let me just tell you, you'd be dead wrong if you thought that about God. God loves you just the way you are. He can take all your dirty laundry and the scripture says he can make you as white as snow. He's better than anybody else at doing this. Matter of fact, he's the only one that can forgive our sins. I mean, he was, he was way better than OxyClean. You know? He's the original OxyClean. He can take anything we bring to him and wash it white as snow. You know, I so wish that we could be physically together today at one of our locations. Uh, we just welcome all of you and with all your dirty laundry. We just say, hey man, Come on in. No perfect people allowed in our church. Bring your dirty laundry. I can help you with that because I've got a bunch myself, you know. You're welcome here. And then we'd try to get you in a circle of friends. We'd try to get you connected in some way. You know what I've learned? Jesus can wash anybody clean. He can wash anybody clean. Notice here in Galatians chapter 6 how Paul describes it. He says, live creatively, friends. If somebody falls into sin, forgivingly restore him, saving your critical comments for yourself because you might be needing forgiveness before the day's out. Stoop down and reach out to those who are oppressed. Share their burdens so complete Christ's law. If you think you're too good for that, you're badly deceived. God's heart for your home and God's heart for his home, the church, is that it would be a place full of grace and forgiveness and encouragement and patience. So, a little review again. Let's go back through this. Solid foundation, lots of natural light, lack of clutter. We got to have a playroom. Got to have a laundry room. One last thing. We got to have this idea of an open concept. It's just a must-have in our homes, right? Uh, this is the new thing that everybody wants today. They want their homes to be open. They don't want walls to divide the family. Now, for us, the church, God's home, I, you know, I'm just talking about living a life that has as few walls as possible. Yeah, I'm talking about having the kind of home that just says, come on in, you're welcome here. You can hang with me. At our home, we got an open home, guys. We really do. Uh, we got an open table. We have an open fridge, and most of all, we try to always have open hearts. I love that Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 12, verse 13, he says this, when God's people are in need, we got a great opportunity right now before us. He says, be ready to help them. Always be ready to practice hospitality. 
And you know, the early Christians in Acts chapter 2, they were known for this. The thing that was said about the early Christians was this. They just love everybody. They just love everybody. Uh, we don't keep for ourselves what's been entrusted to us. We share, don't we? We don't covet what belongs to others. We love our neighbors. We don't do to others what we would not do to ourselves. The church, as Christians, we're bridge builders. We're not wall builders. We're the hope of the world. Today, I understand we all meet in homes. But guys, again, we're going to get through this. And soon, we'll be able to meet together again. And I want to remind you that God's heart for His home is for everyone. It's for you. God invites you to be at home with Him and become part of His family. With all the chaos in our world today, we all need a family to belong to. We all need a relationship with Jesus Christ. And today, if you're afraid or you're anxious or you're lonely today, man, I want you to look at this last verse I want to share with you. I love it. Psalm 68, verse 6. He says, God places the lonely in families. He does. He does. Today, I want to give you an opportunity to become a part of God's family. And many of you in this season, I want you to encourage, I want you to encourage each other, but I want you to realize the importance of needing a church family where we can encourage you and we can be with you through this time. And when we're able to get back to some kind of normal rhythm, man, if you don't have a church home, I want to invite you to be a part of our home here at Islands. We'd love to have you. You belong here. But in the meantime, till we be, you know, till we're able to meet together, then I want to encourage you today, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, man, I want to encourage you to do that. It's the best decision you can ever make. And I want to give you an opportunity right now where you are. If you just pray with me and say, man, in all this uncertainty, I feel like I don't have a solid foundation. You know, I feel like I got a lot of clutter, a lot of laundry that needs to be cleaned. Let's do business with God right now. Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Lord, we've looked at some must-haves today in our life. We all need a laundry room because we all got sin in our life. We got a lot of clutter. God, we need a solid foundation. And it's not this world. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. And so as I speak today to so many that may be on a foundation other than the blood of Jesus Christ today, I just wonder, would you be willing to trade your shaky foundation that this storm has tossed you back and forth into the solid foundation of Jesus Christ? That you just might admit today that you've made some mistakes, that you'd say, you know what, I am a sinner. Scripture says that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. And if you want to be a part of God's family today, he makes it real simple. This is what he says. If you'll believe in your heart and you will speak with your mouth, trust Jesus, you can be saved. You can become a part of the family of God. I just want you to pray a prayer, something like this with me. Just say, dear Jesus, Lord, I ask you right now to forgive me. I know I've made mistakes. And God, I ask you to wash me in your laundry room as white as snow. Today, wash me by the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, today I just surrender my life to you. And Lord, help me even in the midst of the chaos that's around me to build my life now on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. And hey, I just want to tell you, before you look up, if you, if you prayed that prayer with me, when you look up, just in a second, you're going to see on your screen down at the bottom right-hand corner a place where it just says, like, raise your hand or something like that. It just lets us know that you prayed to receive Christ today. And I want you to click that little button, and then we're going to come alongside you. We're not going to bug you in any way, but we want to help you through this. Lord, for the rest of us that are believers, remind us that we have a solid foundation, that when the storms, even a virus such as this, that our hope is in Jesus Christ. And Lord, may we make our homes and our families a place of joy and safety and security during this season. 
We anticipate and look forward for the day that we can meet together again. And until that day, God, remind us that we're going to get through it. We're going to be stronger because of it. We love you today, Lord. Thank you for loving us and being with us every moment of every day in this time. In Jesus' name, amen.